So just a, a forewarning here, I am recording this call, so if for some reason you need to duck out or, uh, you know, person comes in your office and you got to put out a fire, uh, we are recording this call and it will be available in our coaching call archive uh, probably towards the end of the day today. You can always get there by hitting, actually not the help button, you'll want to go to mortgagecoach.com directly. So let me go there real quick. By the way, hitting the help button actually will take you over to, and actually let me open it up in my other browser, I have some cached information. Uh, hitting the help button inside Edge will always take you to our knowledge base, so that's where you can get your questions answered, you can search by keywords, there's all kinds of good stuff there. It's the same thing as if you were to hit help up here and then choose support center. But uh, in terms of where you go to find this QA call, uh, when we're done today, I'm going to convert it and then upload it. It will be available behind this link by the end of the day, but I'm also going to post it as a coaching call here in the August section uh, so that it doesn't get overwritten for future uh, coaching call sessions. But that said, uh, first we're going to start off by covering some of the new enhancements inside Edge, so let's, let's take care of that first. So number one, um, we added a Save as New button in the fee templates in the settings area. So I know a lot of you have been trying to set up your fee templates and it becomes kind of difficult because you can't really copy a template inside Edge. Well, we've given you a way to do that. So all you need to do is create one template inside Edge. And once you've got that template created, hit the Save As button down at the bottom left. And then you can save this one as a new template. So I'll call this one Copied Template so you can see what it looks like. And then hit OK. And you can see now I've got a new one in my list called Copied Template. I can make any modifications necessary. And uh, after that, once I've got all the mods done, I'm ready to go. This one's now going to be available from within my Edge product. So anytime I go to my fee detail, I can now select this new template. So that's just a quick tip to help you get your template set up. It's definitely going to help you with your, uh, your speed in terms of the data entry in Edge to have your templates ready to go. That way you don't have to concern yourself with all the closing cost details every single time you put a report together. So the next thing here is going to be we added some new fields in the assumptions area inside Edge. So when we come into a brand new client, if I check this as own, we've added some fields to help you with the cash to close. I know that this becomes kind of a problem for people because right now Edge uses the current balance of your, of your existing mortgages to generate what your cash to close should be. So what we've done is we gave you a couple more fields. One here is the current total payoff amount. So this field, even though let's say your, your outstanding balance on the current loan is 155, if the payoff is more or less than that, you actually can put the payoff amount here and that's going to be considered for your cash to close. So the good part about this is it still, it still shows the existing balance on your reports in terms of what the borrower actually owes, but when it comes to the cash to close situation, it's going to use this payoff amount field to generate that cash to close. Now you can always hover your mouse over this field and it'll give you the full detail on what this does. Um, one thing to remember about this is if you're going to resubordinate a second, you don't want to use this payoff amount field. You want to actually just let Edge uh, do the calculation based on the current balances. Uh, but that said, feel free to use this whenever you'd like. Uh, it's definitely a good field that's going to help you uh, get that cash to close right. Now the other thing we did is we added an original appraised value line. Now what this is for, and it could be the original purchase price as well, but what this is for is just for the MI calculations. Their current property value may be $500,000, but when they took out the mortgage and they had MI on it, it was only $400,000. So the MI, we want to base that LTV cutoff on the original appraised value or original purchase price. So we're giving you an area here to input what that, what that value was back when they took out the loan so that your LTV cutoffs will be correct on your current mortgages. Now, going forward, You'll notice that uh, we've actually added some, some additional stuff to the affordability section. You've always been able to input a tax bracket here, but I want to let you know that the tax benefit now shows up on the total cost analysis. So it's not only the rent versus own anymore, it now shows up as a line item in the summary section on the total cost analysis. So as long as you want to, if you want to include the tax bracket, always make sure to input the, input the tax bracket here. And if you don't know it, hit find tax bracket. This will take you over, over to an IRS site where you can put in a couple of details and find out what your borrower's tax bracket is. Now the tax benefit, in case you guys need to know the equation behind it. The tax benefit is we take your tax bracket, we multiply that by the monthly interest, the property tax, and the mortgage insurance if you choose to make that deductible. We add those figures together and that's going to be the tax benefit, whether it's 
for the first payment or whether you're looking at the five-year or even long-term section. The tax bracket will determine what the tax benefit is going to be. It uses the monthly property tax, the interest they've paid, and the mortgage insurance if you choose to make that deductible. Now there's a new one in here as well. There's something called tax credits. And what we've done is we've added the MCC tax credit to EDGE. Now the MCC is a mortgage credit certificate. So this is not a, uh, a tax deduction like the other stuff. This is actually a credit that the borrower can take. Now if you're not familiar with what the MCC credit is, uh, you want to consult your guidelines for your state because it does vary by state. However, what it allows the borrower to do is it allows them to get a credit against a certain percentage of the annual interest that they're paying as a first-time home buyer. So we give you data entry points to assign how much is the percentage. Usually it's going to be 25 to 30 percent of the interest that they pay every year. They will be able to take the credit on it. But they usually have caps on it too. It can't exceed a certain amount of dollars per year. So what we've done is we built logic into Edge to let it know that we're looking to, we're looking to get a credit on 30 percent of the interest they're taking per year, but that credit cannot exceed $2,000. So keep this in mind. Study up on the MCC tax credit. This is a great tool for uh, showing an additional benefit to a first-time home buyer. All right, so let's jump over to rent versus own real quick because there's a couple more fields in there that I want to draw your attention to. So in order to trigger a rent versus own inside Edge, all you have to do is toggle this switch over to rent. And then as you go through the screens, Edge is going to ask you for rental information. Now you can see we collect the basics here. This is all unchanged. You won't have to worry about that. But as we said before, you now have the MCC tax credit that you can apply on the rent versus own as well. So uh, you've got the tax benefit already. Now you can apply the additional credits here as well. All right, so let's get into a couple of these products real quick, and I'll show you a couple of the enhancements that were done inside the fee detail. Now when you go into a closing cost detail, and I'm going to pull in one of my templates here. I'll pull in that copied template. We've always given you a way to indicate a contribution. But what if this is a refinance and I've got all my fees added to the loan amount, meaning my amount financed is actually increased by all these fees. Now, if I do that and I want to show a contribution, my contribution is going to cause a negative cash to close. This is going to cause a cash out. So what we've given you the way, a way to do is when you add a fee here, and you select contribution from the drop-down box. Let's say I've got a $1,500 credit. It's a lender credit, but I want it to actually apply to the loan. I want it to knock down the amount financed with this contribution. We've given you the option now. You can check the box here to add it to the loan, so it's adding a negative to the amount financed. You can choose whether you want to apply it to the APR fees or the non-APR fees. Consult your guidelines for that one. Um, but usually you're going to leave this as non-APR. Or if it's a contribution towards prepaid escrows, you can even make it a contribution towards those by checking this box here. So that should help a little bit in terms of speeding it up for you. When you're creating your templates for refinances specifically, if you want to now, you can check all of those boxes to add to the loan amount. It's automatically going to increase the amount financed. And then have a contribution line in there. It's also added in. Just make sure to leave the contribution blank unless you know you've always got the same contribution. That way when you go through on a case-by-case on a case, uh, basis on your reports, you can indicate exactly how much you want to reduce the amount financed by, and it's immediately available in your templates. Now the other thing we did is we allowed for negative percentages in these fields. So this is brand new. Um, let's say that uh, I've got another kind of credit or something, and I want to put negative 1% here. Now you can see that I'm going to have to zero out that field, but negative uh, 1%, I don't have a loan amount in there yet, but if I had a loan amount, it would show me a dollar figure. So let me apply this to the loan real quick. I'm going to go back and put a loan amount in so you can see what this looks like. Okay, so just some basic parameters there. Now we go into our closing cost detail. We're going to find that that negative point is now showing my negative $1,600. And again, that can be financed in as well. So that will reduce the amount financed if you do decide to, uh, to lock it in and add it to the loan. So just a couple of cool little features that allow you to have a little bit more latitude with the way you do your fees should save you a little bit of time as well. Okay, so let's get on to my personal favorite here. Um, 
I'm going to go to the analysis screen. You guys may have noticed, actually, let me go back one screen to the products. You may have noticed that in the middle of the product screen, you used to have a data entry line down here to indicate a principal reduction amount. We took it out of here. And the reason we took it out of here is we put it over in the analysis screen. It's always been there, but we want you to have access to all the reinvestment strategies in one spot. So when you go to your analysis screen and you hit adjust reinvestment strategy, you get a grid that allows you to apply principal reduction payments up at the top. You can apply payments back to their current savings account in the middle section or payments to an investment. But the kicker on this one is you can modify it now. So you're not stuck, for instance, with a $100 payment for the life of the loan. What happens if I have MI on this one? So let's, uh, let's drill into this. If you double click on those fields, it actually brings up a schedule for you. And you can see it shows you where the MI cuts off and what the last MI payment is. So you can reinvest MI after drop off. So let me go put MI on this loan real quick so I can show you what it looks like. Obviously, this is a 20%, so it wouldn't require it. However, I'm going to put it in here. And I'm leaving my cutoff at 78% here. So what I'm telling Edge is that right now we're at 80%. As soon as I hit 78% LTV, that MI is supposed to drop down, it's supposed to cut off completely. So I need to know exactly what that payment is when it drops off. I need to know when it drops off so I can reinvest that money straight back into the loan or into an investment account. So let's go to the analysis screen. I'm going to pull up that, that matrix again. And then I'm going to double click on the term reduction or for that matter, any of the other investment fields that are outlined in blue here. Those are double clickable. And you can see that my MI, my MI cutoff month on this particular loan is month 12. And my last MI payment is $120. So if the borrower has told me they can make an additional $100 payment right now, that's great. So at month one, I want them to start making that additional $100 payment. But then once their MI drops off, I want to turn that into a $220 payment. So how do I do that here in Edge? I add an additional line item. I'm going to indicate the month as month 13. My MI cuts off at month 12. So at month 13, I'm going to start going at 220. Now what this is telling Edge is that from month one, we're going to start applying $100 a month. When we get to month 13, that's going to change to $220 a month. Now if I want to stop this payment at some point in the future, all I have to do is add another line item and make sure it's a zero amount. So for instance, let's say I want this 220 to run for you know 80 months or something like that. Let's say at month 96, I want them to stop making that payment. All I do is put in month 96 and a zero. Now that has stopped the payment. So this, this is showing us that for the first 12 months, they're going to pay $100 a month. Starting at month 13 all the way through month 96, they're going to pay $220 a month. Then at 96, it's going to cut off. So there would be no additional reinvestment after that point. Now the great thing about this, you can also do lump sums. So let's say you've spoken to your borrower and they've told you that, you know, in about a year I'm going to be coming into about 10 grand and I want to put that straight back into the loan to try and pay it down faster. Okay. So let's get rid of these guys. You can always delete these line items. And remember he told us in about a year he's going to get this. So at month 13, I want to indicate a lump sum of $10,000 going straight back into principal. So if I did nothing else right now, this would show every month after month 13 a $10,000 investment going forward. That's obviously not what we're doing, so we need to cut this one off. So we're going to add another line item, month 14, zero investment. This has effectively shown a lump sum principal payment at month 13. Now you can use this for any kind of reinvestment you want because this grid works on the savings, it works on the investment. You can actually mix and match them too if you want to. Now one thing to keep in mind is that you can't do a customization on the second right now. So currently, the customized reduction payments are only available on the first. Um, they're not available on the seconds in any of the situations. And actually, let me add a second there, because I do want to show you one thing. You do have one capability uh, as far as seconds go, but you won't have it with the, uh, the investment and savings. So let me add a second real quick, just so there's something to fill in. Okay, so now that I've got a second in there, when I bring up my matrix, you'll see that the principal reduction box on the second lien is available. And you can see it's no longer grayed out. I can actually double click on this one and I can customize the principal reduction on the second. I just can't do it for 
the accumulation area here. And that's just primarily because the accumulation is not tied to an amortization schedule. This is just a global account that you're going to contribute to. So if you want to, and this I see a lot, especially if you have a first and second, you can apply principal reduction payments towards the second. Then once that gets paid off, you can start reapplying that entire amount back into the first. So if I was going to do that, let's say that uh, I'm going to put $100 payments into the second, and you can see my freedom point is 16.75 years. All I would do is customize this first and start reapplying the entire sum to the first mortgage after 16.75 years. So you've got a lot of latitude with what you can do with this, and you can use them all in unison. So let's say I've got $500 to work with. I can put $200 into my reduction. I can put $150 into the savings, and then another $150 into my investment balances, and they will all run together. Now, one thing that's really cool is we also have this payoff first with accumulation. So if you are setting aside monthly money, and let's put it in our investment so I can give it a rate of return. Say I've got a 3% rate of return, and I'm putting $200 a month away in there. Now you can double click on these if you needed to uh, if you needed to edit them, but you can see at the 15 year point I've got 45 grand in the bank here. So when will I have enough to pay off the first with that accumulation amount? Well, I can check my amortization schedule, and that's probably going to be the best option. But check it out. If I look at my freedom point up here, I'm looking at a 30 year freedom point. But if I choose to pay off the first with my accumulation. That means at 21.25 years, I will have enough in my accumulation account to pay off this note and continue accumulating. So now you can show what happens if they make a bunch of payments towards, towards their investment account. They're developing this nest egg. You can show them that when they have enough money to pay off their note, they can pay it off. It zeroes out their investment account and starts reaccumulating with whatever monthly uh, costs you want to, or what monthly savings you want to show there. Now, for instance, if they've paid off the first mortgage and the second mortgage, their entire mortgage payment is now reinvestable. So at that point, after 21.25 years, you can put the entire payment in there. So this 968 plus 268, you can pop it in there at uh, 21.25 years, and it'll continue accumulating going forward. Now, when you're showing an accumulation, always remember that for the long-term metric, you want to show the total net worth. And the reason for this is the net worth is a compilation of your equity at this point. And again, we're looking at the 15-year point right now. So your equity plus any liquid assets that you've developed for them. So this is really important. Their net worth is the one that's really going to show that accumulation. And you'll see that as if you do that payoff loan at uh, Freedom Point, if you push this long term past that point, you're going to find that the equity is, of course, you've got total equity. You've paid off the loan but you've still got that new liquid asset that you're reaccumulating, and it'll continue going forward as long as you want it to. This is a limitation that uh, you couldn't do back in the old product. It would stop your accumulation at the end of the term. You can keep it going for miles on this one, so feel free to use this one as needed. All right, so uh, that is the customizable accumulation and reduction. Play around with it a little bit. See how you like it. Uh, I have a feeling that you're going to be using this on a lot of your refinance presentations. Or if you're, if you're looking at comparing, say, for instance, I saw this come across my desk the other day. If you're looking at comparing conventional versus FHA at a high LTV, you'll note that FHA has to carry MI for the life of the loan, but your conventional doesn't. So you could potentially reinvest that MI payment when the conventional MI drops off straight back into the mortgage to shorten the freedom point. Or put it in the investment account and you can start developing them a nest egg. But either way, it's obviously going to make that conventional look a lot better than the FHA in the long term, and it's going to save them some money. Now you can show them how to reinvest that money. All right, so a couple of other features I want to draw your attention to before we touch on the video, and then uh, I'll answer any questions that we have in the box here. So one thing that you may or may not have noticed yet is on the partner side, we've now given you the option to send a simultaneous alert to your partner. So let's say this is Joe Partner. Now I'm going to put in as much as I can, obviously. This is just a sample report for you. But we're going to fill out all the details for the open house flyer or the seller buy-down strategy that we're trying to do. We're going to input our products. Then we're going to go over to the contact screen. 
Now, very important here, make sure you've got an email address listed for your partner if you want them to receive alerts like you do. Um, so let's say uh, joe at realtor.com. Now, once I have that in there, when I get to the final presentation screen where I'm generating my report, let's say I choose the uh, open house flyer, I'll put in my presentation title, pricing label, any notes that I want to appear on the flyer. Select the image. I didn't upload an image in this case, but you would select the image. And then now there's a new checkbox here. Send edge view alert to partner. Now what this does is first when you send this report, you're going to send it to the partner and you're going to have that intro video like what we were talking about on the Tuesday call that Shira did. Now very important, the first one that goes out, you probably don't want to check the box here to alert your partner. But after you've made that initial connection and you're going to repurpose this report now to be delivered to the consumer, meaning you're going to have them share this on their Facebook page. You're going to have them uh, put this on their website. You know, there's, there's a lot of places that they can put your link. But if you want to gauge the effectiveness of that link and you want the realtor to know the effectiveness of it, click this box to send the edge view alert to the partner as well. They're, going to, they're actually going to see that edge alert come across by email on their desk. And it's just going to tell them this report has been viewed for such and such amount of time and uh, it gives them a link to the, to, to the presentation. So if they want to open it up and check on which one it was, they can see that. Now one thing I want to let you know is that the edge alerts cannot track who viewed it. Just so you guys know that, I'll repeat that. Edge alerts do not track who viewed it. Instead, they send you an alert that says presentation for Joe Realtor has been viewed for 20 minutes and 15 seconds. Here's a link to the presentation. So you want to set that expectation with your realtor as well. There's no way to capture who actually viewed it. The most we could ever even pull out of that would be probably an IP address and it wouldn't mean anything to you. So just keep in mind, this is a gauge for how effective the presentation is and how much consumption you're getting. So try this out. You know, first obviously send it to the realtor partner, you know, get that conversation going and then let them know, hey, you know, I'd like to push this out to my social media platforms. I'd like you to do the same. And then I'm going to trigger my system to automatically alert you every time somebody views this, this presentation so you can see what kind of traction we're getting. It's a great inroad and it helps them be part of the equation. All right, so one of the last things we did, and I'll show you this actually when we get over to the video presentation, is we added a minimize command for the video player. Now we've had a lot of people asking if, uh, if they can actually put some kind of a minus sign there so it, it reduces the video but still plays it while the person is viewing the report. So what we did, and I'll show you this again when we get towards video, is we gave you a way to hide the window but continue playing the video. So now it won't cover up that bottom right quadrant of your report. The video and audio will still continue to play and they can always bring it back up if they need to. So again, I'll show you that in just a few minutes where, uh, where, where we're actually going through the video part. So let me try and address some of the questions in here uh, so you guys can get those taken care of and then we'll go ahead and jump over to video. Okay, so Jim's question, uh, what are the best strategies for working with a listing agent? Um, I can't go too in depth on that today, Jim, but I will tell you that the, the ones I see coming across my desk the most are, you know, like we saw on the Tuesday coaching call, that past, present, future report. It's very simple to put together, but it really does, it really does issue that, that sense of urgency. And it's a great intro to your educational expertise to your realtor partner. So, you know, as they said on the Tuesday call, it's, it's most important not for you to have all the numbers going perfect. The most important thing is that to sh you're showing that you are an educator in this field. You are the expert. And the information that you're relaying is important to all parties involved. So I would say, one, past, present, future. That's definitely an important one. Um, the open house flyer is a great courting tool, tool as well because you've got co-branding on it and that is an, an immediate uh, inroad with most realtors. They love to see their face on something, so keep that one in mind. Uh, the seller buy-down strategy, also a very good one, but I would caution you against using that in low-income areas. Uh, usually you want to target the, the high-value properties with the seller buy-down. Uh, you know, the lower, lower properties, there just isn't enough inventory right now, so you're not seeing a whole lot of price reduction on those. You're seeing bidding wars in most cases. But on the higher price properties, the jumbo loans, those ones tend to have a little bit more leeway, and they may have actually undergone a price reduction already. So if you're going to target those ones, look for the ones, say, on Realtor.com or Zillow or something, and find the ones that have been on there for a while. Find the ones that may have already undergone a price reduction. 
and then issue that seller buy down strategy based on that property and court the realtor with that because the realtor is getting sick of looking at that property it's been sitting there too long they're not going to make money on it if it keeps reducing in price so you offer them an alternative well don't reduce your price anymore let's try a rate buy down by the seller that way you can still sell at full asking price you make your commissions you know borrowers happy because they get a lower rate everybody involved is basically happy with the situation because they don't have to do any legwork to attract additional buyers and qualify lower income all right uh, uh, Louis he asked has the mobile version been released for Android yes sir matter of fact Louis if you've got an Android phone simply send yourself an edge link and then click on that link from your Android phone it's going to take you over to the Google Play Store where you can download and install the app and then once you've got that installed on your phone you can bring up any presentation at any time with your Android device keep in mind that uh, your clients also get this same type of interaction so when you send them a link no matter what device they open it on if they open it on their computer it's going to show the presentation as you would expect it to look if they open it on their iPhone it's going to show the iOS version of the app if they open it on their droid it's going to show them the droid version of the app but again it will prompt them to go to the download stores for each one of those to install it all right uh, Michael's question he says is it possible to compare two different arms for example a 7-1 versus a 10-1 versus a 30 fixed absolutely Michael in fact all you're doing is just showing three different products against each other and I will put one together for you real quick here So here's my basic 5-1 arm. Now let's say I can get him a 4% on a 30-year term. Now I am going to select arm instead of fixed. Now anytime you're doing an adjustable rate mortgage, you notice there's a lot more data entry that you'll have to do. You can pull all this information from your rate sheets. So keep it in mind, um, when you're, for, this, for this particular case, I'm going to assume the caps are 5-2-5. So it's 5% first adjustment cap, a 2% periodic cap, and a 5% life cap. So here's how you would enter that. So my first adjustment cap is that first five. The first adjustment month is the month after the fixed period. Since this is a 5-1 arm, it's going to be month 61. My periodic cap is that 2 in the middle. So remember, this is a 5-2-5, so this is the 2. Adjustment months. This depends on the index you choose. You can check your rate sheet for this, but if you're, say, doing the, uh, the one-year LIBOR, this is going to adjust every 12 months. Now, max rate is going to be your life cap plus the start rate. So if I know that my, uh, my life cap here is 5% and my start rate is actually 4%, my total is 9. The margin, this will be listed on your rate sheet. It's usually 2 and a quarter or something close to that, but make sure and look at the rate sheet for this one. Choose the desired index. Remember I said we were going to use the one-year LIBOR, so I'll go ahead and choose that. And if there was a floor rate, you can enter that as well. You don't have to, but it is there for you in case you want to indicate a floor. Now, by choosing worst case scenario, this is going to assume that at the first adjustment point, this is going to adjust up to the max first cap. So it's immediately going to the life cap. This one's going to stay at the life cap for the entire term of the loan after that first adjustment. So it may not be realistic, and it's going to produce a pretty high APR. Now, best case, on the other hand, will go completely the opposite. That says at month 61, it's going to adjust down to index plus margin, which in this case, 2.25 and 2.6, we're looking at, well, about 2.9 here for the rate, and it's going to stay there for the rest of the loan term. That's not realistic either. So what I would tell you is hit the custom, and what it allows you to do is it allows you to specify when you want these to adjust. So let's say at month 61, I want it to adjust up a quarter percent, and you can see what it does. It goes up to 3.165, and that's from the, uh, the fully indexed rate here of 2.915, I'm adjusting up a quarter. And let's say that maybe at uh, month 73, I want to bring it up a full percent. And you can keep doing this, but what I would encourage you is spread out the payments or the, the adjustments a little bit so your APR isn't too high, but definitely do get to a life cap at some point in the loan term. I would say, you know, maybe month 180, bring it up like 3% or something. And uh, I know my life cap's 9, so I'm going to add one more, and I'll put it at 240. And I'll put another 3%. Now, it won't adjust over 9. So even though I told it 3% above the last rate, it still backs it out. So it, it kills it at 9%, and it stays there for the life of the loan. Now, in order to do a comparison on this, all you're going to do is do a second product that's going to be a 7-1 arm. 
And all you would do is change your first adjustment month. So instead of month 61, that's going to adjust at month 85. If it has a different index, you'd want to, of course, change that. But you can compare four arms against each other on one presentation. It's perfectly acceptable. Just make sure that you're aware of what the scenario that you choose is going to do with your arm so that you can qualify what, what the education is that you're delivering. All right, uh, Dan's question, he says, I have, I have an opportunity to be an in-house lender to a local real estate company, and I'm not sure how to best put together an introductory video for myself with some solid strategies. Any help would be greatly appreciated. So, Dan, I would model it after uh, what Shira did on the call. Um, very generic in terms of, you know, if you've received this, you're one of my, you know, trusted real, realtor partners, something like that. But you kind of want to beef them up a little bit introduce yourself, talk very cursory about what the, the programs are that you're offering, but let them know that you have a wealth of different programs in your arsenal that you can offer. You don't want to, you don't want to give them the milk yet. You want to, you want to just kind of give them the teaser to get them attracted with that intro video. Once you've got that intro video in there and you've got that, that call to action with them to determine, you know, what, what are the other kinds of scenarios I can do? You know, are you aware that an FHA loan is not always the best opportunity anymore? You know, ask them questions like, like Roberto was saying on the call. You know, ask them a question that's relative to their particular scenario. They're a realtor. They're making commissions off their sales. So ask them a question that is going to immediately make them think, oh, wow, this could impact what I do. So I would say that keep it very simple, Dan, on, on the initial video. Just an intro video with who you are. You know, let them know you work with the top realtors in the area, that uh, you can offer some creative different types of financing that will help them to move property listings, uh, and let them know that you want to partner with them so that you can both build your bases together and, in fact, educate the consumers while, at the same time, closing more loans. So getting them, you know, the commissions, you know, there, there's, a, there's a touch point for them, and you can definitely find it. But remember, the intro video, short and to the point, kind of give them a teaser on what you can do, but don't go in depth on anything. Then when you've actually made the call and they want to see a presentation with some of these different types of financing, you can show them an FHA versus a conventional. You can show them, let's say, a 95% conventional with a single premium MI buyout. There's lots of different things that you can show them that battle the traditional notions of what a mortgage should be. You can even show them how they can invest using a 5-1 arm. I mean, I know arms are kind of scary for some people, but when you really look at it, if you're looking at investors, arms are great because they're going to get out of that property before it starts adjusting. So don't dismiss any of the loans just because there may be a stigma in the market. Instead, try to educate the person you're talking to as to why there shouldn't be a reason for concern, why this is a necessary uh, type of program that will work for a lot of their buyers. So hopefully that helps there, Dan. Um, let me know if you'd like further clarification on that. I'll see what I can do for you. All right, let's see. Uh, John's question, uh, is there any plans to add a debt consolidation module like the old MC? There isn't right now. We do have plans in the future, but it's not currently in development. We're actually going to be building out a new type of report that's going to be specifically for that. But if you'd like to know how to work around it right now, because you can do that already in Edge, uh, send us a quick email over at support. We'll give you the workaround for how to do a debt console here in, in Edge. And you'll find that you can do almost everything that you could do in the old software. The only thing you're not doing is itemizing the debts. So what you're showing is just a cash flow savings and then a reinvestment opportunity. But send, send us a quick email, John, over in support. We'll get you the details on how to do that. That goes for any of you guys. Uh, if you want to uh, get a little bit more detail on how you can do a debt consolidation inside Edge, send us an email at support at mortgagecoach.com. We'll give you the details on that. Oh, so Rich had a comment about uh, the analysis I was showing earlier with the payoff point. The analysis was for 15 years, and the freedom point was 21.25 years. So, Rich, you're absolutely right. What I should have done in my analysis screen is move my long-term years out far enough to get past that freedom point so it can start reaccumulating. So in that case, I would change it from 15 years to 30 years so that after that 21 and a quarter year point where they pay off the mortgage, they're still going to continue accumulating past that point, and my edge presentation will show it in the net worth. Uh, Lisa's question, she says, so then can we keep a partner list in Edge when we work with them all the time? Uh, you actually do have a partner list in, in Edge, Lisa, and, and maybe I need a little clarification on this, but your partners are all listed here under the View All tab, so you can actually see every single one you've ever put in here. Um, in terms of 
I, I'm not sure what you're asking. You might want to give me a little bit more clarification on that, Lisa, and I'll try and attack that for you. Uh, Yvonne's question, with click-to-call, how are you notified? What if you're not at your computer? Can you have it forward to your cell phone number? Ah, absolutely. So click-to-call, I'm glad you mentioned this. This is a great lead capture tool, especially when you're going to push a, uh, a presentation out to your social media platforms, especially co-branded presentations. You want the person who's consuming the report to immediately be able to get to you. Now, what click-to-call does, and let me see if I've got it in here. What click-to-call does is it allows you to choose which number you want to use. You can use your office number. You can use your cell number. What it does is it puts a button on any of your reports that says, call me now. Now, when the person who's viewing the report clicks that button, it's going to immediately try and call whatever number you specify here in the settings, and it's going to say, hi, there's a call from Mortgage Coach, um, from click-to-call, actually. Would you like to accept the call? Now, if you press 1, it'll accept the call, which means now our click-to-call service is going to call the borrower and connect your two phones. So you'll immediately be talking to them. Now, if, if you choose not to accept the call, which you can do, I, I want to say it's you press 2 to do that, but when you choose not to receive the call, it automatically pops up a scheduler on, on that person's computer so they can tell you when they'd like to receive a call. When they do that, when they schedule a call with you, it will automatically send you both a rate watch alert, so a pop-up, a little toast pop-up in the bottom right corner of your screen to let you know that there's a click-to-call request. It'll also send you an email. So you'll have uh, plenty of ways to get in touch with this person, and uh, it should be a great, very valuable tool for capturing that lead, especially when your link gets passed around a lot. All right, so... Oh, John's question, this is uh, more of a feature request. He says, can we put a countdown timer on the video to make sure I don't go over five minutes? Well, John, I'll tell you, there's actually two different limitations on the video. There's both a file size limitation and a five-minute mark. Now, if you've got a super HD camera, it's doing a lot of screen capture. The frame, the frame rate is actually much faster. It's capturing more, and it's storing it as a much bigger file. So you can find that, specifically, super high-def camera, you might only be able to get two and a half minutes in there before Edge cuts you off. So there's really not a timer available because we've got two variables going there. What I would tell you, though, is just like Roberto said on Tuesday, keep it at two minutes. You never want to go to five, to five minutes on your video because it's just too much information. You start losing people's attention over about two and a half minutes. So try and condense it a little bit. Keep it at about the two and a half minute mark, and I think you'll find you have a lot of success with that. Uh, Jim's question, can the realtor alert only given on the seller buy-down and then the open house then? Yes, that's correct. So what, what Jim was asking is the realtor edge alert views. They can only be applied when you're doing a partner presentation. So this is for just the seller buy-down and the open house flyers right now. We are considering adding that to the total cost analysis in the future. But as you know, the total cost is not co-branded as of yet. Um, might require a little bit of a restructure of the presentation. And so Jim has another question. So the intro video should be done on the open house flyers. You know, I, I would do it there. Honestly, I think it's a great way to do it because you've already got their co-branding information on it. Um, I think it's a perfect uh, olive branch to, to leave out there. But, you know, as you saw on our coaching call, a lot of people do use the total cost analysis for, the, for this as well, but they make sure to cross-sell the realtor during their video. So rather than co-branding, they're mentioning the realtor. They're mentioning what a great uh, person uh, to, to have as a partner, all that kind of good stuff. They're beefing them up a little bit. But if you're going to do a TCA, I mean, obviously that past, present, future works great. Um, a cost of waiting is also always effective, you know, just showing them, you know, what it costs to buy right now and what the potential downfalls can be for waiting a couple of months for, say, a price drop or something like that. And, you know, the time they wait, rates could go up pretty significantly. So also a great one to do. Um, if you guys ever want to learn how to do these additional strategies, we've got videos for every single one of them. So when you go to our help section here, and I just hit help, you can select or just type in cost of waiting and hit search and there you go how to build a cost of waiting presentation so there's there's a lot of different strategies in here you can also find them under the strategies tab here so things like how to, there it is how to build the cost of waiting you know how to do a harp refi how to show a cash out refi there's eight of them in here so take a look at these when you get the chance this might give you some great ideas for uh, for delivering some solid presentations Okay, uh, Josh's question, after doing a TCA and the audio video, can I add a highlighting feature or is that something I do at a different time? Great question. All right, so when you do a video inside Edge, you have the ability to highlight the report. 
but you can do it at any time. I will tell you that your highlighting, it doesn't get captured like a screen capture recorder. So if you're expecting for things to light up in the middle of your video and then drop off, it's not going to happen. What it is, is it allows you whatever state you leave your report in when you close it. So let's say that I, uh, I had an 80, 10, 10 versus 90 from last week. And let me go to the presentation real quick and preview it. I'm going to generate my link. And I'm going to add audio video. Now, if I start recording right now and start highlighting things while I'm recording, Edge is not going to capture the timing on my highlights. But what it will do is if I was to close this report right now, even after I've recorded a video, when my borrower or my prospect opens this, whatever I left highlighted is going to be highlighted on their end when they open up the report. So just remember that if you do want to highlight after you've done a video, that's fine. It's perfectly acceptable. In fact, you know, you may be talking about a specific topic that you really want to draw the client's attention to. Leave it highlighted before you send them the report. That way it's automatically in their face and immediate. So they're watching your video, you're talking about a process, you're talking about the total payment on this conventional 90, and it's already highlighted for you. So there's, uh, there's definitely some use for using the highlighting uh, with your video. Just remember, it's the last state you leave it in. Okay, and then Michael's question, are we going to cover video on this call? Absolutely, we're going to get into that in just a moment. Uh, Corby's question, is there a way to prepare a presentation on a tablet? Not currently. Currently, our mobile apps are all presentation viewers, so they're not data entry devices. Uh, the only way you can prepare an Edge presentation right now is from a browser on a computer. Now, I'll qualify that by saying some Android tablets can support Flash in the browser. If you have an Android tab with Flash in the browser, it, it will be able to open Edge. You would just go to the regular Edge link like you would do in your computer, and it's going to be a little smaller because you're on a tablet. However, it, it will work, and I've tried it a couple of times, and it's not too bad. It's, it's worth it if you've got uh, an Android browser. But um, we are considering a uh, data entry application for the future. It's not in the works right now, just so you guys know, uh, as we're working on a couple of other huge fixes and builds, um, you know, incorporating things like the debt consolidation is going to be coming up. Uh, we're also considering putting in uh, the marketing mailers at some point toward the end of the year. So lots of things on our plate right now, but uh, eventually we would like to get you guys a data entry app for your mobile devices. Uh, Brad's question, he said, I sent a link to myself yesterday and it didn't open on either Apple or Droid phones. We'd have to see the link, Brad. I'm not sure why that would be happening, but uh, it should prompt you to immediately go to the App Store to download that, that app. And once you download the app, you can click on the link again, and it'll open inside the app. Um, the caveat is when you first click on the link, you have to you have to go and download it. Otherwise, the next time you click it, it just it'll prompt you to download again. But um, that sounds like something more for the support desk, Brad. If you would send that over to support, and we'll see if we can help you out on that. John's question, do I need to have clients download the app link before they get my Edge link? It's not a bad idea. Uh, if you want, you can put the link to the Edge app on the bottom of your email. Uh, it'll save one step, but realistically, as soon as the borrower clicks on your link from their device, it's going to prompt them to install the app anyway. So not terribly necessary. It just might save you a couple of seconds of time. Nancy's question, will, will we be able to in the future create a presentation on our iPad? Okay, we already addressed that one. We are hoping to be able to do that in the future, but it's not currently going. Uh, Robert had a question about the debt consolidation. We answered that one earlier. So eventually, yes, that will be inside Edge. It is not in there as of yet. Uh, Robert's question on arms, are the index percentages updated automatically or should we be sure to check against the Wall Street Journal daily published rates? They are updated automatically, Robert. So uh, you you can be confident that every time you go into Edge, we're pulling the most recent data for each of the index values. All right. And it looks like we've answered a lot of these questions. Uh, Clark's question, can you copy a partner open house to a new client analysis? Not possible currently. There's just too many different fields between the partner reports and the client reports that there's just not a one-to-one -one mapping available. Um, we are considering instead having some co-branding available for the total cost, but again, that's going to require a complete revamp of the way the presentation looks. So I wouldn't expect to see that anytime soon. Uh, but what you can do, Clark, and what works for me, 
is uh, when, you, when you've got a presentation that you like that's an open house and you want to convert that to be a total cost, save each of your products as templates. That way, when you open up a new total cost, you can just bring in each of those templates that you had already saved, and you can, it'll save you a lot of time on re-preparing the report because all the closing costs are there, all the loan parameters are there. All you got to do now is add a new video to it, um, structure a borrower name on it, that kind of good stuff. But it uh, should help you save a little bit of time. Uh, Harlow's question, do we have any samples of intro videos? You know, I have the one from, uh, from Shira from yesterday. Uh, if you email support, we'll send you a link to that, but it's also on our Facebook page. So if you guys haven't seen this, make sure to check out our Facebook page. And I'm just opening up in Firefox right now. This might take just a second because I'm kind of limited on bandwidth right now. There it goes. And I'm going to take you over to our Mortgage Coach Facebook page because I do, do want to show you a couple of things that are available up there. Um, anytime we have a coaching call, we always post additional content up there. So let's go to the Mortgage Coach page. And you can see we've got announcements about uh, next week's call, uh, the one with Ken DeLeon. This is going to be a webinar for the public as well, so the link is not the same one as you use for your regular Tuesday calls. Make sure to sign up for this if you haven't done so already. We've sent you a lot of marketing collateral on it as well, so if you've got one of those emails, just make sure to register for that. And then uh, if we look down here, we can see, and let me find those links for you. Okay, so we've got, uh, actually let's view all the comments here. We've got the comments based on Roberto's stuff right here, but if we scroll down just a tad, I believe Anthony posted the links directly. And I'll have to search more for it. I don't want to waste your time right now. But uh, there are two links. There's one for, uh, for Shira's video, and then there's one for Frank Blakely's video. Uh, if you guys want copies of those links, just send us an email over at support, and we'll get those out to you. All right, Steve's question, any Windows 8 issues? The only Windows 8 issue I've run across is that if you're going to use Internet Explorer, you cannot do it from inside that, that Metro GUI that they have, that, that start panel with all the tiles on it. If you click Internet Explorer from inside there, it opens up a version of Explorer that does not support plugins. So I would tell you, if you've got Windows 8, install Google Chrome. It's going to get you around the whole mess, and Google Chrome handles Edge much better because it's got Flash built in, so it's not a plug-in like it would be in other browsers. So I would just recommend Google Chrome on there. Stay away from Internet Explorer if you can possibly avoid it uh, on Windows 8, uh, just because it'll get confusing in terms of opening it from the desktop versus opening it from that uh, start tile. Uh, so Will's question, so if you sent a link out and then went right back in afterwards and highlighted, it would be on the video you did earlier. It's not attached to the video. It's actually on the presentation itself. So your video would still play, but whatever you left highlighted on the presentation when that, when that partner or that borrower clicks on it, it's still going to be highlighted when they click on your link. So yes, absolutely, if you go back, go back in afterwards and highlight, just leave it in the state, you know, close out the presentation after you've got all your highlights in place, send them the link, and then uh, when they open it up, they're going to see your video playing, but they're also going to see the highlights that you left. Okay, John's question, any way to upload the video to YouTube? There's not currently a way to upload Mortgage Coach videos to YouTube because they are tied to the presentations. Um, YouTube requires a hard copy of the file to be able to upload it. And since this is a streaming video, there is no hard copy. So not possible as of yet. Harlow's question, any way to make the realtor's picture larger on the presentation? Not currently. Uh, it's actually bound by you know, the same kind of dimensions as your photo is. So as long as the realtor's image is set like a wallet size, you know, a portrait, 100 by 150 in pixels, it's going to fill out the entire placeholder for it. There's no way to make it bigger than that. But just make sure and get it as close as you can to, uh, to those dimensions, and it'll fill out the placeholder completely. All right, so let's get into video. I know we've only got 10 minutes left here, guys, but I want to try and give you as much as I can. Um, it, we will stay over just a tad, so I understand if anybody has to leave, uh, feel free to go. We'll, uh, we'll take care of it uh, another time. But uh, we've also got this recorded, so you can always review it. All right, so video. There's, there's a couple of things that 
you just got to always make sure you do. So I'm going to bring those up. They're just bullet points on what, what you should look out for with your video. But first, I want to show you how to set up your devices. So when you get to the last screen in the presentation in Edge, after you've generated your link, you have an Add Audio Video button. Now when you click this, it opens up your Edge presentation, but it's a little bit different preview than what we were looking at before. You can see that now we've got a record message button down in the lower left. We still have the clear all button so we can clear all, all our highlighting if we want to. And then you've got your call me now button that your borrower is going to see. You've got a share button, a print button, and a save button. Now I would tell you that anytime you want to print or save a PDF of one of your Edge presentations, Always, always, always use these buttons. Do not use the print function inside your browser. It's going to print really funky for you. Do not use a print to PDF function if you can possibly avoid it because what happens is it's going to scale it sideways. This is a horizontal project. You're going to get a vertical PDF and it's going to look odd unless you've got a PDF editor. So keep in mind, just always use these buttons. When you hit print, it's going to print. When you hit save, it's going to give you the option to save as a PDF. And these are going to be the clearest possible copies you can get. All right, so setting up your devices. Now first, you gotta have a webcam. If you don't have a webcam, you have to at least have a microphone. Having a microphone will allow you to do an audio-only presentation, but ideally you wanna get a webcam so you can do both. Now, usually you're gonna plug it in to your USB slot on your computer. If it's a brand new webcam, they probably sent you a, a disk with some driver software for it. You can install it if you want, but you don't need to. Edge will automatically recognize that once Windows sees the device, so you're going to be okay on that one. Now, after you've got your device plugged in, and most webcams have a microphone built in, so I would look for that kind of webcam if you're shopping for one right now. Don't spend more than about 35 bucks. Don't get the Super HD camera. It's not going to do you any good on your Edge presentations. Now, if you're going to be do, doing daily YouTube video uploads with your webcam, sure, go for it. But uh, if you're just using it for Edge presentations, don't spend much on this. The, the lesser priced cameras have the smaller bit stream, and they're going to stream a lot better online. So I, I, would, I would go with the Microsoft Live Cam, probably the 2000 or the 3000 are the two ideal ones that I would recommend. Now once you've got your devices plugged in, all you have to do is on your Edge recording window, right click anywhere on the screen. Then you're going to hit settings. Now you'll need to go over and choose the mic that you want to use. Now Chrome will always give you an option for using the default. I prefer this option, but if you're going to select default instead of the specific one, you can see I've got a zillion different devices on my computer right here. The reason I select default is because I know that I've already got one set as a default. So if I look at my recording devices in Windows, and this will come up momentarily, you can see all the different cameras I have, or all the different microphones I have going on. Now the default one is this one right here, default communications device. So that's the one that my, uh, my Edge presentation is going to choose unless I tell it otherwise. I would always recommend that when you choose your microphone, the, the default one that's listed here should be the one that you choose in here. Whether you choose default or that specific device, just make sure they match. Um, otherwise, you may find that your sound's not recording. So watch out for that. If you ever get a no sound presentation, 10 to 1, you need to go back into your Windows settings and select the microphone in question and then hit set default. Now you can get to this screen here by right-clicking on the little volume icon at the lower right corner of your screen and hitting recording devices. That's going to take you over to all the recording devices you have on your machine. Then you can set the preferred one as your default and you're good to go. Now the last part here is you've got to choose your webcam. Now I have an integrated webcam on this laptop as well, but it's on a dock right now. So I've got a Logitech H HD cam that's uh, set up on here. And again, this is the lowest HD cam you can possibly get. I spent $32 on this. <coughs> Excuse me. So once you've got your devices in there and you see them listed, you're good to go. You don't need to do anything more in terms of settings. So you hit the close button and then you're going to hit record message. Now this is going to bring up a, an Edge video window. So one thing to keep in mind is you probably want to take a look at yourself on the video before you start recording. There's some bullet points that I'm going to go over with you real quick on things that you need to do like you know, lock your door, turn off your phone, all that kind of good stuff. But um, when you're ready to record, all you're going to do is hit the record button right here and then when you're done recording, you're going to hit the stop button. You don't need to do anything further after that point. Your video is already appended to this link. So once you're done recording your video, you can jump back over into Edge. You can copy this link. 
and you can send it out to your prospective borrower or partner. All right, some bullet points on videos that are going to help. All right, so first and foremost, you always want to talk to the camera as if there were a client sitting across the desk from you. Now, in order to do this, what I find as a very effective tool is write all of your talking points as bullet points on a sticky note and post it behind your webcam. That way you're always looking at the webcam for the entire conversation. You don't have to tool around your report to try and see what you're talking about. You already know. Now, as Roberto said, keep it cursory. Not too much information in that first video. You want to be able to explain all of it to them on the phone, but you just want to give them enough detail to pique their attention and call them to action. For your phone, turn off your ringer. Put your desk phone on Do Not Disturb so it doesn't ring in the middle of your presentation. That can be very, very annoying. Uh, it happens to me quite often, so I'm one of the biggest offenders on this one. I would also tell you that along with this, turn off your email. Your email, if you have notifications set to pop up, they're going to get in your way. And if you're getting a ton of emails coming in while you're trying to record, it's not getting captured on the recording, but it is annoying. So make sure and turn that off as well. Lock your office door. You don't want somebody walking in on you in the middle of a presentation because it's going to pull you out of your element, and now you've got to re-record. If you have a large window behind you, drop the blinds. If you've got a lot of light coming in from behind you, it's going to flood you out a little bit in terms of how you look on the video. So drop the blinds, close the curtain, whatever you've got to do, but you don't want light coming in from directly behind you. Light overhead is great, so don't worry about that, uh, but just keep it in mind. Try and get as much darkness behind you, and it'll accentuate how you look. Sit up straight. I can't tell you how important this is. I, I see videos come across my desk every now and then. It's not often, but uh, I see them come across my desk where people are slouched or you know just kind of hunched over a little bit during their presentation. And this usually comes along with them trying to focus on the presentation instead of the webcam while they're recording. But it makes you look like a bean counter. You don't want to look that way. You are a mortgage professional and you are a salesperson by default. So. Make sure that the presentational image that you're delivering across is not Big Bad Banker. You are now their educational mortgage professional. So sit up straight, smile, make, make it salesy as if you would with any other presentation that you do in front of a client. Now some of the things that Roberto mentioned that uh, I kind of grabbed here, speak about the major benefit or value proposition for the client. So we don't want to go into too much detail on here, but remember what Roberto was saying about asking questions. Find that touch point for your borrower or your partner. Ask them a question about it and relate it to the benefit. So very simple. If I'm showing you know, that uh, FHA versus conventional presentation I was talking about earlier, where I'm showing the MI drops off on the conventional and I'm reapplying it, if I'm sending this to my borrower, my, my question is, do you want to pay mortgage insurance for the life of your loan? Very simple. Now they're thinking about it. Now they're, wait a minute, I have to pay mortgage insurance for the life of my loan? Let me watch this a little further. Now you're showing them an option where they don't have to do that. So you're using the question and the value proposition in one shot. Now, as, as Roberto said, don't reference each and every number or detail of the presentation. Use very global terms when you're talking about this. As you can see from the report, I'm able to save you $16,000 in interest over time. That's a very global position. You're not driving their attention to the individual fields that cause that savings. You're just giving them the result. Now, Roberto prefers it under two minutes for the videos. So I would challenge you to try and keep it under two minutes if you can. Now, most of the presentations I see come across my desk are between two and four minutes. Now, that, it, it's, like I said, after about two and a half minutes, you start losing the attention span of most people. So if you can keep it under two minutes, you pretty much have a guarantee that everything that you've said has been heard. <laughs> Reference or cross-sell the referral partner. So if you're doing, whether it's a total cost analysis or you're doing an open house flyer that's co-branded, always make sure and reference the referral partner if there's somebody who sent you this lead. It's going to help them continue to keep sending you leads. So um, you want to keep that business, that, that partnership going. And obviously, if you can beef them up a little bit during the call and you can, you can relay the fact that, you know, I'm a mortgage professional and I've chosen to work with this realtor because he's one of the top realtors in our area. He is also very professional at what he does and we want to try and deliver this educational process in an easy fashion to you so you can make an educated home buyer decision. Something like that. Obviously, don't use my words, but um, 
you know, make sure to beef them up a little bit during your presentation. If you want an honest reaction, send your first video to a colleague, spouse, or friend. And I, I would tell you that you know, probably the spouse is going to be really hard on you. So I would send it first to a colleague. Um, for your first one specifically, if you're comfortable with the way it looks, go ahead and send it out. But I would tell you if you want a review of it, send it to one of these people or feel free to send it to support at mortgagecoach.com. We'll take a look at it. We'll watch your video and uh, we'll give you some tips and tricks or we'll tell you, hey, this is perfect. Send it out and hurry. And then the last part, always have a call to action at the end of your video. If you trail off at the end of your video without giving them a reason to call you back, they're not going to call you back. Now, they might be so interested in the content you're delivering that they'll have to, but I would tell you that as long as you put a call to action at the end of it, you're keeping it fresh in their mind that they need to contact you. They need to get in touch with you to discuss these options that you've, you've been talking about. You know, they have something they need to do at the end of it. There's an onus on them. So what this does is it shifts it from you just being the guy who's doing a video explaining everything for them to... I'm the guy that, that can produce all of this for you and I want to explain it as much as possible so you can understand every part of your mortgage decision. Give me a call so we can discuss how you can use this type of financing or how this type of financing would be better than another type. You know, just give them a reason to, to want further education on this. All right, so a question came through. She says, uh, it was from Elizabeth. She says, can we get this Word document? Uh, absolutely. I will save, actually, I'll save it, and then if you guys want to email support at mortgagecoach.com, I'll send it out directly to you. All right, so hopefully that gives you a, a good idea on what you need to do for your videos. Obviously, the setup and recording part is, is very simple. All you're doing is choosing your devices, make sure they work, hit record. So not, not too terribly difficult. Um, the hardest part really is that first couple of videos that you do because you're going to be the most critical person on yourself. So keep in mind, it doesn't have to be perfect. Matter of fact, you know, I've said this over and over in our QA calls, a little hiccup in the middle of your video actually humanizes you. You know, you don't have to be a, uh, a movie producer <laughs> to put these out. You are a mortgage education originator. So when you consider that, you don't have to be perfect on your video. All you've got to do is make sure it gets the points that you want across and that it gives them a reason to call you back so you can further explain or pursue other options. All right, so a couple more questions in here. Um, Yvonne's question, can you highlight the headings? So yes, you can highlight the headings on your presentations. And if we look at this, all you have to do is left click on that and it highlights the entire row. So it's not just the headings, but it will highlight that entire uh, column, I should say. Um, these ones you can highlight as well. They're highlighted individually rather than all the way across. So yes, you absolutely can. Anything that when you hover your mouse over it, if it creates a box, you can highlight that field. So if I want to do just specific fields, I can do those as well. Uh, if I want the entire thing, I can highlight the top and it'll go all the way down. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that when you highlight a, an entire product like this, it's going to stay highlighted in the other more info screens. And you can see when I opened up my more info on the right side, it's still highlighted. All the info is down on this 801010 is highlighted because I did it over here. All right. So uh, Michael's question, what does it mean when the video stops then starts? That might actually be your, uh, that might be your internet connection, Michael. Uh, actually, I'll add this bullet point. <laughs> if you're on a wireless, make sure to connect with a hard line connection if you possibly can. When you're recording your videos, the better network connection you have, the faster it's going to stream and the more clear your video is going to be. So if you're trying to do it at Starbucks and you're on with 75 other people on a wireless connection, you're probably going to get a really lousy experience on your video. Now if you've got a dedicated wireless that only you're using, you probably have pretty good speed on that and you should be okay. But if you have the option to switch over to just plugging in a network cable, that's going to be your best option for making sure that your internet speed is, is good enough to capture everything in a nice smooth fashion. All right, uh, John's question, where's the best place to add points to a loan? In the templates or in the edge step-by-step -step where, where it says points? So it depends on you, John. Um, if you're going to do it in the templates, I mean, you can do that. The problem with inside the templates is that when you're in the closing cost detail, you have the option to add those costs to the loan amount, meaning you're going to increase the amount financed by the amount of those fees. Since points need to be based on the total amount financed, not just the base loan amount, 
I would say that don't put them inside the templates because that's just going to reference the base loan amount. It doesn't know what the total amount financed is when you're inside the uh, closing cost detail. I would, I would say do it right here. Put it in the point section. It will show up as a point. And then you can actually hover your mouse over it, and it'll tell you exactly what that dollar amount is if you wanted to know. Um, this will show up as a dollar amount in the summary section of your reports as well. So when you're doing a total cost analysis and you drill into the more info section in the top left, uh, it will show you all the totals just like we're seeing here. But for the points, instead of showing one point, it's actually going to show points equals $3,200. All right, and thanks, Will, for joining us. I appreciate you being on this call. Uh, David's question, uh, can't you rip video on Snagit? Uh, Snagit doesn't allow you to capture video necessarily. It's more for screen capturing, but their, their sister software, I guess you would say, it's, it's all done by TechSmith. That's, that's the, uh, the name of the company that does Snagit. But TechSmith also supports Jing, which is a very easy way to do screen capture recording. Um, Jing allows you to record up to five minutes and post it up to their screencast site so you don't have to worry about finding a repository for your video. Uh, it's very effective. A lot of people do use that and that's the free version I'm talking about. If you want to actually get the paid version, it'll allow you a little bit longer time for your screen capture videos. Uh, the one I use for most of my stuff, it actually, I use Camtasia. Uh, Camtasia is a lot more in-depth type of video production tool. Uh, not necessary for those of you out there unless you're going to be publishing a lot to YouTube. Uh, if you're going to be doing that, you probably do want to have a video editor ready to go. But Snagit can definitely be used to snag images of your of your report. In fact, I use Snagit too. Um, I'll show you what I mean here. Oops, there we go. So it'll allow you to do uh, an image capture. And once you use that, basically you can drag a box around whatever you want to capture. And then once you release the box, It'll capture that as an image and allow you to edit it. And you could then save that image. You could you know, put it in an email, whatever you wanted to do. You can mark it up. Say, for instance, you wanted to point out certain things. A lot of people use this type of tool for the rate watch. Uh, when you want to send somebody um, an update to what the rate watch candlestick charts look like for today, they'll, do, they'll snag an image of the charts, and then they'll mark it up with you know, lines and circles and, and indicating what they're trying to display. You know, things like showing trend lines and such. Uh, if you want to show your own trend lines like Dan does on his daily videos, he's using a tool very similar to this. All right, uh, John's question. If I say to someone that there's two points, does that show anywhere uh, or just the dollar amount? Currently, it just shows the dollar amount. It used to show the two points, but we found that that led to a lot of confusion with people because it wasn't totaling up. Uh, so it just shows the dollar amount there. So what I would tell you, John, is if you're going to include points on one of the loans, I would build it into the name. So, for instance, my uh, loan product here that's an 80-10-10, I would call it 80-10-10-1-PT, so they know that there's a point in there or something like that. Uh, Doug's question, is Snagit good for video capture as well? can't remember if you just said images are also video. Um, and John actually responded to that. He said Snagit does video recording on it now. They just integrated it. So on the new version, Snagit 11, it should have some video recording capability on there. Uh, I have an older version, so mine does not have that capability, but definitely check it out. Uh, John says Jing is going uh, by the wayside, so uh, um, you want to check out Snagit. They've probably integrated a lot of what Jing used to do in there. All right, so it looks like, uh, and actually Doug had a question real quick, is there a downside to video capture in quality? Um, you know, it depends on, I, I imagine you're still talking about Snagit for doing a screen capture recording. Thanks, Doug. All right, he, he replied yes. Um, there's not a downside on video capture quality, but I will tell you that if you have your video playing on your Edge presentation while you're doing a, a screen capture recording, you might find hiccups in the Edge video itself because now you're using your, your graphics driver to try and do two videos at once. So very well could, unless you have a great graphics card on your computer, it very well could run into some hiccups within the Edge video or it, uh, it you know, it might black out the, the little edge video altogether. I'm not sure because I haven't played around with the Snagit uh, video recording yet. But I do use Camtasia for just about all my videos. So if you're looking for a real, a real tool that will allow you to do screen capture and incorporate all the other kinds of video files and then reproduce it for YouTube and stuff like that, definitely Camtasia. That would be my recommendation. Uh, it's very user-friendly. It's, it's not that expensive. It's, you know, a single price for a lifetime membership on it. So it's definitely worth, worth your time if you're, if you're going to be going into producing videos for things like YouTube. 
Okay, uh, Elizabeth's question. She says, what frequency is Bill Hart talking or Todd Duncan, or did Todd Duncan replace him? Ah, so it's actually supposed to be weekly for Bill Hart. Um, Todd Duncan's is going to be weekly as well. I, so I would imagine we're going to get both of them weekly. I think right now Bill went on vacation. So I think he may have ducked out for this week, but it should resume again next week. But both of those should be weekly calls or, or weekly videos, I should say. But you can always check on them if you want to open up the, uh, the Rate Watch commentary. You can actually see them in order. So this is the same thing that you get when you take and copy and paste Dan's link into a browser window. And I'm going to pause it for right now. Okay, so you can see that we've got Dan's videos in this playlist. That's that Rate Watch August 7. We've also got Todd's videos in here. And if you scroll down a little bit, we'll find one of Bill's videos as well. So uh, you, can, you can feel, you know, that's that real connections right there. Feel free to scroll down this list. There's hundreds of videos in here. In fact, if you wanted to see what the market looked like, you know, in the early part of the year, you can see Rate Watch on March 18th. That's our earliest one. And uh, that one is, you know, if you really wanted to go back that far, you can see exactly what Dan said about that particular time frame. But we've intermixed the, the Bill Hart ones and the Todd Duncan ones in here as well. So you can always just scroll down a little bit and you'll find the most recent ones. All right, so hopefully that answers everybody's questions. Thank you all for being so interactive on this call. I really do appreciate it. I have recorded this, so if you guys need to see a recorded copy of this call, I'm going to be posting it up in our support center. And actually, let me show you that one more time real quick here. Oops, let's go to there. Okay, so if you come to our website and hover your mouse over Community and choose Coaching Call Archive, I'm going to have this link available behind this one right here. And I'm going to put it as a secondary item here in the August coaching calls. So this one will be available to you. So thanks, guys. Appreciate you joining me. If you guys have any questions on any of the new updates, or for that matter, if you run into anything that you need us to fix on it, let us know. Anytime we push out something new for you, we rely on our members to, to help us fine-tune it and get it perfect for you. So let us know if you need any help on that. We're always happy to help. Thanks, guys. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.